Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm very pleased to be joined by Michael Liebreich. Michael, as most of you will know, is, is the former founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance and one of the leading uh, analysts and, and voices on, on the energy transition uh, globally. So welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining me. Great pleasure, Nadim, as always. <laughs> you're, you're going to be speaking again at the World Hydrogen Congress, where, where you turned some heads and, and got lots of people talking last year. Um, it's fast approaching us. There's been a lot, a lot happening, I guess, across across the energy sphere over the last year. Lots of, I guess, turbulence. Um, but yeah, give, give give some of your thoughts and and and, and um, feelings about how 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 the uh, how the markets are developing in in the wider sphere of the energy transition, and obviously, obviously, referring also to to hydrogen. Well, so first of all, let me thank you for having me back this year. Uh, after the uh, keynote that I gave last year, I was a bit worried that I would be uh, persona non grata uh, because I was trying to sort of sift out between the things that uh, hydrogen will really have to do for us, uh, clean hydrogen, obviously, and the things that really don't make sense. And this is my hydrogen ladder. Um, if you look at the interim, let me start with hydrogen. Um, really, we've seen in a number of different ways that sort of filtering proceeding. So we've seen uh, projects in land transportation, you know, buses, trains actually falling away. Uh, but we've also seen quite a bit of progress around hydrogen production. So some big projects reaching final investment decision. I'm thinking of things like uh, NEOM in Saudi Arabia uh, and a lot more work, a lot more sort of focused thinking around the use of clean hydrogen at the top of the um, uh, of that ladder. So things like petrochemicals and fertilizers. So we are you know, pretty close to where I would have hoped, would have thought we would be. And then we come to the overall picture for the clean energy transition. Um, it's probably a slightly darker picture this year than last year. Uh, we have obviously the war, Russia's war on Ukraine continuing, which you know casts a, a, a heavy pall over the whole energy sector. Um, keeps energy prices high, absorbs capital, geopolitical, I mean, you know, never mind the human cost, which I should also uh, obviously acknowledge. Um, but we've also got high interest rates and they look like being persistent high interest rates. Um, that's very negative. You can see the impact on, for instance, the UK's uh, latest bidding round for offshore wind, which uh, failed because the cap was insufficiently high. Um, you, you just see a lot more sort of stickiness in. I mean, having said that, there is, uh, you know, we're expecting to see record amounts of renewables installed by quite a long way, 450 gigawatts uh, through the year. So, you know, it's not all negative, but it's all, it feels like a lot harder work than last year. And then, of course, we've got political cycles, uh, the election coming up in the US, which may or may not start to kind of chisel away at that Inflation react, uh, Reduction Act. Uh, we've presumably got uh, an uh, uh, we 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 have to have um, an election in the UK at least before the beginning of 2005, and you know I actually think that we will continue to work on net zero. Very committed, both parties, despite the politics. The problem is that it puts a sort of hiatus on decision making, so everything is a little bit on hold in the run up to elections. So it's a little stickier, but you know life goes on and progress continues. In terms of you mentioned high interest rates, and it certainly seems to to, to be an era now that's here to stay. And certainly, maybe the, the politics is changing. Obviously, there's been a lot of press around Bidenomics, uh, Bidenomics, which whatever that's defined as, but certainly it's, it's certainly a lot more public largesse. And we've seen in previous energy transitions there was a lot of government involvement as well. So, given where we are now, and, and also I, I think specifically the, the the high interest rates, which for, for industries like like renewables, where it's all up front, uh, can be a com considerable break on, on development. Are you, are you concerned about that, especially when you start taking into political risk and looking at trying to uh, fast, you know, fast inject the, the energy transition in, in developing countries where you've got obviously got greater, greater uh, exchange rates, uh, sorry, interest rates? Yeah. So in terms of um, the cost of renewables, um, I was talking about this actually on my own podcast, Cleaning Up, with Paddy Padmanathan. And I call him the Usain Bolt of solar because he kept on breaking his own world records for cheap solar power. And uh, what he was saying is that the, the world record project, which was uh, $10.40 per megawatt hour, just over a cent per kilowatt hour, today 
would cost something like seventeen dollars per megawatt hour. So something like a you know a a fifty percent uptick in the costs. But he said by 2026, 2027, it'll come back down. And he's very confident before 2030, we'll see that kind of one cent solar power uh, price point being broken, you know, being approached again and then broken. Um, So, you know, it's really the interest rates will not stay high forever. And also there will be more innovation. And, you know, the supply chain that's really under stress is the wind supply chain, which has been losing money and uh, Siemens had this huge write-off and it's pretty much under under stress all around. But again, they will innovate, they will rationalize their product range, they will focus on a smaller number of bigger models. Uh, there will be, as I say, innovation also around the financing. And I've no doubt that um, wind, uh, you know, it, it absolutely not, it's not just that it's here to stay, it will take off again, it, it will continue its growth. Uh, difficult years, maybe two, three, four, but then it'll go. Um, the point you raised about the developing world is a really important one. That's one that I'm going to be watching uh, very closely at COP28, which is coming up in uh, Dubai, because it's all very well to say, well, wind is cheap, solar is cheap, batteries are cheap, energy efficiency is cheap, hydrogen is cheap, whatever. But it isn't if your interest rate is 15% because you are Ghana or uh, or, or, or Mali or Ethiopia or whatever. And it's great if the interest rates are low. Um, so this delta between the developed world and the developing world, that's really got to be fixed. And there's a big initiative called the Bridgetown Initiative. Um, and that's being sort of um, uh, syndicated around the World Bank and the various MFIs, the multilateral uh, finance institutions. And you know, that's around insurance and it's around uh, using some sovereign guarantees in clever ways. I'm also an advisor to something called RELP, R-E-L-P. And the goal is to narrow that spread but because, frankly, it's too high. It's not justified by actual risk. A lot of it is, you know, kind of emotional baggage, historical baggage. It's, well, you know, n- nobody, nobody got fired for losing a billion here or a billion there betting on some you know developed world utility like pg and e but if you do the same thing and you lose some money in the developing world that's career finishing and so there's a lot of sort of almost like emotional reasons why that gap is is frankly higher than it should be and also lacking products lacking insurance products and so on so there's a lot of focus on trying to squeeze that gap down so that more of the global south can benefit from the technologies that you know, we all know are basically here, here to stay and and pretty cheap. Is it, is it around sort of capacity building around those sort of finance mechanisms that can create commercial projects in those regions? I think we need a sort of multi, you know, a multi-point strategy, right? Because um, partly it is, as I say, lack of products around insurance or um, uh, uh, just... Uh, uh, but there's 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 a lot of different things that we need to do. There is also a lack of projects, and um, so the a lack of inventory and what does get created. A lot, most of it is sort of targeted at oh well, you know, let's get money out of the World Bank or let's get money out of the Africa Development Bank, and you know this thing really starts to scale when you can ignore those institutions. And if you look around, a lot of these you know the global South, we now have capital cities that have got skyscrapers. I mean, they're financing real estate. So how come they can finance a, 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 a skyscraper, but not a renewable energy project? That makes no sense. Uh, but there's also reforms of, for instance, the um, uh, the energy law. So you look at South Africa and they have these rolling power cuts and it's catastrophic for the economy. And the amazing thing is it's not shortage of generating capacity. In fact, the opposite, they've almost got so much generating capacity that nobody's making any money so they can't maintain it and therefore it keeps falling over and then they have the rolling power cuts there's a lot of things that we need to do there's no there's no single solution and in terms of building the grid in the in those regions is it they simply have to just get better at building those those grids and and getting them to work and and be resilient Is is there any sort of opportunities around that resilience that you can see yeah so there's a lot of very interesting things happening um, so I, I talked to Anna Hajduka of um, uh, Africa Green Co. And she's been pushing for and uh, uh, and, and developing these um, 
inter international sort of you know, regional power markets helping to develop them. Obviously, the, fundamentally, the African countries themselves have to you know, sort of do the work. But that then enables, for instance, if you build a wind farm or a solar farm and you sell the electricity, but your off taker then is not bankable and maybe goes bankrupt or can't pay, you then have both the wires and the regulations to be able to sell that power to somebody else. So that makes that investment resilient where two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, it would have been far too risky. So there's an enormous amount going on and we have to kind of attack the problem from lots of different uh, sides. And, and I guess circling around or, or I guess continue on, on the power grid and I've seen the report um, that I think you mentioned and, and I saw on your podcast um, about the Royal Society and, and the use of hydrogen to, to balance those grids um, specifically, obviously, the famous Dunkel Flauter in, in, in Europe, but obviously, I mean, I envision us going to, you know, 80% renewables, 90% renewables and needing, needing backup storage in uh, vast quantities, particularly, you know, long duration seasonal storage and hydrogen playing a very essential role there. Um, and potentially our electricity grids growing from currently 20% to say 70, 80%. So there's a there's a flip from ele electricity from electrons and molecules switching position in terms of their their value in 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 the clean energy system is that big picture how how you see how you see the transition happening yes and i think over the last year we've seen that again starting to sort of crystallize and clarify um that there is now a much more general understanding that we are currently 20% of our energy needs are being met by electricity. And in any clean future, any clean future, that number is going to be 70%, 80%, 90%. Um, direct electrification is the thing. Um, but there is always that last piece. And one of the things that's very high up on my hydrogen ladder, you know, so the top row is things that we're already using hydrogen for. Uh, but the second row is things that we really, I can't see how we're going to do any other way. And one of those is long duration storage. Now, it might be ammonia or it might be methanol or it might be, you know, who knows, DME or uh, or, or um, liquid hydrogen organic, or what is it, organic liquid uh, LOHC, um, yeah. liquid organic hydrogen carriers, or it could be hydro hydrides. We don't really know. Um, so there's been a very big report produced by Professor Sir Chris Llewellyn Smith in the UK saying that we need a colossal amount of storage, not for you know, day-to-day, uh, -day because obviously demand response and car batteries and transport batteries will deal with that. But every so often, it's not just the Dunkelflauter, it's much worse than that, because you can have a Dunkelflauter after a whole bunch of months where the wind output has been quite low in the North Sea, after a few years when the wind output and maybe even the solar output has been quite low. So if you take a long time horizon, you can really have trouble keeping the lights on if you go to this, you know, 80, 90 percent electric economy and you haven't thought through the long duration storage. And, you know, and yes, we'll do interconnect before anybody kind of floods the airways and floods the social media. Oh, well, Michael didn't mention my favorite technology. Yes, we'll do interconnections. Yes, we'll do, you know, all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, deep resilience means being 100 percent sure that you keep the lights on and the role of hydrogen there is interesting and i think it is clarifying and you know i'm going to be over in japan in a few weeks and uh, you know they've been talking about uh co-firing and then firing with ammonia that's an incredibly expensive way to serve your whole economy but if they manage to do a lot more you know solar uh wind onshore to the extent they can geothermal that's another area where there's been a real acceleration in the last year um, uh, geothermal is starting to actually, you know, have the renaissance. Everybody's talking about it ought to have. Um, and then, of course, offshore wind in Japan. If they did all of that, much cheaper than burning ammonia. But then you still need probably the ammonia to keep the lights on um, when there might be, let's say, a tropical storm or there might be a, a longer period with a big drop off in wind. So. I think the nuance of understanding the system has improved since I spoke at uh, the Congress last year. Um, but these, that's sort of still somewhat theoretical. It's not translating into projects 
either proposed and certainly not projects that have had their final investment decision. And I think that's going to be another big topic for the Congress. Why are these projects not getting actually approved? They're getting proposed. Everybody's counting them. Lots of euphoria, hundreds of billions of this, hundreds of billions of that. But actually only a few billions or tens, not even really tens of billions, actually flowing, actually changing hands. And in terms of um, one area to highlight, I guess SAF, we've we've seen the first, I guess, compliance market with the, with the with the EU in terms of specifically the e fuel component at least, uh, but equally before that, that the heifer or the or the 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 the, the, the bio based um, um, SAF as well. What, what what are your thoughts on on that hard to abate sector? Well, so um, yes, those sort of commitments that the aviation sector made so, oh by 2030 we can do this in 2035 five percent what are all those numbers we start to really approach the point where we need them to deliver and their feet need to be held to the fire um i think i can see very clearly how the heifer or the um you know hvo or the whatever approach that you do to a bio-based SAF, i can see that actually accelerating in a fairly healthy way at a vaguely affordable cost I'm going to be completely honest. I don't see the e-fuels for aviation um, being affordable. And, you know, 1%, the RFNBO, 1%, if it sounds that's 1%, you know, how hard can that be? Well, the answer is very hard, right? Because the 1%, that's the non-biologicals. So that is truly an e-fuel. And, you know, Europe spends, I think it's 600 billion euros on fuel. So if you take 1% of that, it's 6 billion euros a year. And if you force Europe and European consumers or taxpayers to pay that, if that 1% becomes, let's call it five times expensive, which is, I think, what we're talking about for an e-fuel, for minimum four times, then what you're actually saying is, instead of buying fuel for 6 billion, we're actually going to be forcing Europeans, either through taxes or through what they spend on that fuel, to be spending 24 billion or 30 billion every year, every year. Now, I don't know, to me, 24, 30 billion, these seem like quite large numbers. So I would not be at all surprised if uh, we simply fail to get to that 1% because the costs become apparent. Um, I don't think they'll happen naturally through, uh, you know, I, ca I can't see them happening. I think if you then start to use something like the hydrogen bank to help deliver them, you'll very qu quickly make transparent the scale of the problem, the scale of the subsidy or support that's required to get to even 1% e-fuel. And I, I think at the end of the day, they'll have to be a rethinking. Excellent. And, and that rethinking, by the way, where it will go is, you know, can only go one of one of two places, either relaxing the one percent or the five, whatever percent um, or a lot more biofuels or, frankly, combination. So the carbon coming from bio, but then being enhanced and combined with hydrogen, electrolytic green hydrogen. That's probably the area that I would that I would think can kind of yeah, that's the compromise that, that yeah. we'll get to. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point in terms of combining the the bio and the e-fuel, um, so an e-biofuel, e whatever that is. Well, but, well, um, the, uh, Rob Miller, the uh, the professor at the Whittle Lab, calls it PBTL, power so, and bio to liquids. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Excellent. Well, there's a lot, um, well, certainly a lot to work on, certainly a lot to talk about. Um, we look forward to, to you coming again to the World Hydrogen Congress. We'll be speaking uh, I think on the uh, the 12th of October, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people and a lot of debate. So, so many thanks to Michael. And uh, I, I, look sorry. to seeing you in Rotterdam. I, I really look forward to it. Um, I, you know, I really look forward to getting into the discussion. Hopefully we won't get too hung up on somebody's, you know, e-taxi, uh, sort of, uh, hydrogen taxi or hydrogen two-wheeler and all the stuff that I was sort of having a bit of fun with last year. And let's get really stuck into where we do need the hydrogen and how we're going to do that. Excellent. Look forward to it. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.